Welcome to Cherry Beckard's Professional Services Podcast. My name is Bryn McNeil, and I'm an audit partner with a focus on serving architectural and engineering firms within our professional services industry group. Along with me today, I have Eric Poppy, who is a managing director in our GovCon advisory practice. Today, we'll be focusing on adequate system reviews. By the end of this podcast, we're hopeful that you'll be able to better understand when and why it may be beneficial for your company to have one. All right, let's jump right in. So, Eric, what are the various system reviews that you typically perform? Well, thanks for having me, Bryn. Um, so that's a great question. So I work with primarily or really any company that does work with the federal government. And with that, um, for companies that perform certain types of work with the federal government, there are system um, requirements to have a quote unquote adequate system. Uh, and from the government's perspective, um, there are six different business systems that a uh, a and the government contractors should have, um, depending on your size and the nature of your work, to be performing work with the federal government to be compliant. Um, and those are accounting system, earned value management system, estimating, uh, material management and accounting system, property management, and purchasing system. And th these requirements for these six different business systems really can depend, again, on the size of your organization, the type of work that you're doing, um, but we see them for all shapes and sizes of companies. Awesome. Well, kind of expanding on that and getting a little more nitty gritty with the types of companies, but when would it be good for a company to look into having one of these system reviews and are there more common ones that some of these companies may get relative to others? And great question. So um, typically the first system that becomes uh, applicable to companies is the accounting system. And typically after that, it's estimating and purchasing. And if you're kind of thinking this as a timeline of growth, as you get larger of an organization, that's when earned value and um, material management and accounting system um, criteria come into place. And property management is more of a system that's on the side, really de contract dependent on if you're managing a, a you know government property. But the first one that usually comes calling to a company is the accounting system. And that is you're supposed to have an adequate accounting system if you have any type of flexibly priced um, or cost type work with the federal government. Doesn't matter if you're small or large. Uh, it's just if you are doing that type of work, you might have these accounting system criteria that your system needs to be set up in a certain manner to hit it to be compliant and to also get that work. Awesome. Are there any like size limitations or system limitations that a company could run into when it comes to having an adequate accounting system or what do you see there? So typically, so the current trends that we're seeing again, accounting and then purchasing and estimating, um, but there really are no size standards um, when it comes to the accounting system. It's again, the type of work that you're going with. There are certain thresholds for the other business systems um, excluding government property, which is more, again, if you have that clause in your contract. But the other systems are our size thresholds. But we're seeing it right now trickle down to um, you know, two small businesses via solicitations because the government's using that as a way to score um, a company's um, potential ability to win a contract on their scorecard that if you have an adequate system, you'll get more points. Um, but again, typically it's es uh, accounting, then estimating and purchasing. Now, when I talk systems, um, I'm not talking about, you know, your ERP or the software that you're using for estimating or your PO, your purchasing system that you manage POs through um, in AP. It is people, process, procedures, and practices behind that software or application that you might be using. You know, good example um, is for like an accounting system. One of the main, the first criteria is you need to be in compliance with GAAP. Well, that has nothing to do with your ERP. That's sure. the the accounting practices behind it. Uh, so, uh, and the other examples that we have is for estimating, you need per, uh, adequate supervisor review and training. Again, nothing to do with if you're using ProPricer as your software for estimating, or if you're using some type of CRM tool to help with your manager proposals. It's the practices behind. So um, it it really can depend. Um, and I'll also state that, you know, for like A&E firms, for example, you are uh, a lot of A&E firms have to have audited overhead rates. And I know you do a lot of that with your clients and we help set yeah. them up a lot of times. 
Well, the underlying principles for um, an overhead rate audit is based off the AASHTO guide. And the underlying principles in the AASHTO guide is the Federal Acquisition Regulations, FAR Part 31, the cost accounting standards. And that's the exact same principles that are used for um, a lot of our system criteria when we're doing these different types of system reviews and when a company is looking at it. So um, really, you know, size and limitations, it, we help uh, companies are seeing these requirements and it could be all shapes and sizes, A&E, professional services, manufacturers, it really can can depend. Yeah. So I know we always love when there's the fire drill and there's a company that's going after a proposal and it has this requirement in it and they come to us and say, <laughs> we need it yesterday. Yeah. But assuming that companies can kind of plan a little bit ahead of that, you know, when is the right time to do this or when would you advise companies looking to do one of these business system reviews? And then same token, how often do they last or how how long will the certification last and the approval last before you need to do it again? It's a great question. So if you're starting to see these requirements pop up in your solicitations, um, it, then, you know, that's a good sign that, hey, you might want to consider doing this. Also, part of your strategic plan, if you think you're going to be expanding significantly in federal work or you are trying to expand more into cost plus work, you know, the accounting system really is the first one that you should be trying to tackle. Um, and if you then are really, you know, you maybe you're an emerging small business and you're now really trying to get ready for full and open competition, thinking about purchasing and estimating. Um, but again, though, we are seeing requirements to weed people out in uh, companies out in solicitations. So it you know, might be uh, you should definitely consider it if you're starting to see that pop up, um, especially in some of the large GWACs and IDIQs. Yeah. Uh, so typically these are good once you do have an audit or once you have an approved system. It's good for three to four years as a shelf life. So it's not something you have to do every single year, which is positive. That's a good um, thing. Yeah, it really is. Um, but, you know, the downside is a lot of times for these system reviews, you know, the government actually performs these audits and they're all based off Gagas. It would be a Gagas audit if the system if they're coming in. Um, there are three systems that are being reviewed by DCAA and three are performed by DCMA. DCMA is technically not Gagas, but if it's done by DCAA, it is. Now, that being said, you need to have a need by the government to come in and perform these reviews. So what a lot of companies are doing is they're having third parties perform them, you know, like Cherry Becker, we do it as well, um, to at least have a adequacy letter or an audit performed um, under a test standards to be able then respond to the government or solicitations or include as part of that proposal package and to have as books as part of the records. That's great. So that kind of answers and lends into one of my other questions, which was, who can kind of do this work? And it sounds like it does depend that there are scenarios in which Cherry Beckard can help and do these, but also there's times when unfortunately it just needs to be done by the government agency and not by us. So um, is that correct in, in what I'm saying? 100%. And, you know, we get questions all the time of like, hey, we have this requirement. Um, we can't get DCAA or DCMA to come perform a CPSR, contract or purchasing system review, or an accounting system, like what can we do? And we sadly have to always say, like, you know, talk with your contracting officer, but there has to be a request put in for these audits to be performed. Um, and then also have discussions with your contracting officer that if you have this requirement and you're just not on the radar for whatever reason, what are, you know, reasons that could you have a third party do it? Um, and then it's also solicitation uh, can be based off of it can be different for each solicitation, excuse me. We see some solicitations that state, you know, this to get points for this approved system, it has to be performed, the uh, adequacy has to be issued by the government. Other times it says by a third party. Other times it says third party under Gagas. Other times it says on letter. So it like really can vary solicitation to solicitation. So if you're kind of looking at this, um, you know, it's the gold standard is, Gagas and, you know, the kind of the lesser versions of the same review is, um, you know, under AICPA consulting standards. That being said, it's the exact same criteria you're reviewing in one instance versus the other. It's just 
to meet those professional standards, the amount of documentation and some of the other work papers that you have to do between, you know, like fraud interviews and items like that. I'm talking about internal controls, but uh, really the same criteria as the underlying basis. Yeah. And I would just say, I feel like sometimes these solicitations throw out the word audit and yep. not necessarily understanding exactly what that means. So if you ever have, I feel like confusion, you know, sometimes it is good to to get a third party just to confirm, is this something that can be done under consulting? Does this need to be under the attest standards or GAGIS? Um, and really, is there an audit being performed or an examination being performed? But I know those terms all all are a little loose there, but certainly something to hone into. Well, that's a good point. And um, if you are early enough in the solicitation process and you can submit a question on that, definitely do, because we've seen uh, clients um, submit questions on that word audit and then get it clarified that like, oh, they don't really mean, a, you know, they're using the, the government's using the word audit like it's a review or it's right. a, you know, just a quick little or an assessment versus a, you know, what we us accountants think of the word audit and the weight of that. Um, right. So definitely get seek clarification. And we've also had companies that have said, you know, we understand the risk of us submitting a um, adequacy letter stating under consulting standards, it's not technically an audit, but we feel like this uh, meets the bill for the requirement and we're going to see how it comes out in scoring. So um, it really can depend and, you know, definitely talk to, you know, as submit a question if you can or talk to legal counsel or your advisors to help out because it is confusing. Yeah. So if a company is just going um, about getting a, a an approved or adequate accounting system kind of for the first time, what tips or tricks would you say um, kind of would be the most helpful to be aware of to be successful in getting um, kind of an adequate accounting system approval? Well, so for accounting or for, you know, any of the other systems as well, first look at the criteria because you might be actually performing a lot of this um, and not really realize it. Um, so for an example, uh, for estimating, I mean, you know, making sure there's proper training for staff to put together budgets and pricing, and I'm not quoting the criteria directly there. So those listening don't hold me exactly to that, but this, <laughs> the, the criteria is the ideas behind having proper training or proper review. If you have a system, uh, you know, you might already have a way to capture who takes training and have proper documentation showing evidence of that training or a good system to review proposals um, and showing evidence of approval for that. Um, you know, first, again, look at the criteria and see what you can leverage. And if you, because again, you might be hitting most of the criteria already and not even realize it, or it might just be a small effort to document a little bit more. The second thing that you can do, um, especially if you're really growing hard in the government space is, you know, have a mock assessment done, a gap assessment. You know, we do these for clients all the time. Um, and it could, and usually a lot of those assessments is first, hey, how do you leverage what you currently have to meet the criteria? And then what are the blanks that you have to fill in to meet the criteria? Um, and then, um, you know, after you have set up your system to be compliant um, and it's capable of doing that for purchasing and estimating and, you know, the other, the, really it's now you actually have to do the process that you say you're going to do in your policies and you're managing the proposals in a certain way and estimating a certain way and, you know, filling out your uh, going through the um, PO process in a certain manner and doing what you say you're doing in your manuals um, and having a good population for when the government does come in to conduct these um, assessments. Now, that being said, <clears throat> um, you know, another way that companies help out, you know, we help companies out and other companies do too, is doing mock audits and actually doing exactly the assessment that is needed. So like our yeah. team has former auditors, that DCA auditors and um, DCMA folks, that that's what we help out with doing. Um, so there are a few steps that you can take, but I think the biggest one is don't recreate the wheel. Usually you can leverage a lot of what you already have, especially if you have good policies and procedures already. It just might be a little bit of a different lens that you're looking at it through. Yeah, that's great. So I know at one point you did mention if you are a uh, emerging small business, but maybe just highlight kind of what's the benefit or why would this be advantageous if you are an emerging small business to look into having a business system review performed? 
This is another great question. And, um, you know, a lot of times we talk with companies that are like, well, you know, we just don't want to make the investment right now for X, Y, Z reason. Um, and, you know, we it's it's definitely a concern when it comes to, you know, you only have so much cash flow and you have yep. to manage to that. However, um, what's nice about these systems is, yes, it's more documentation you have to do. Yes, it's more policies and that you have to manage and follow. Sure. However, it's a really good springboard to build that basic infrastructure to then um, really help springboard for when you do have rapid growth, because now you have very consistent policies and procedures in place. Now you have very consistent practices in place and everything is uniform. So it helps out a lot if you have rapid growth. It also helps out if you have um, any type of turnover in your different departments for purchasing or estimating or accounting. The other piece too is that this does um, dovetail really nicely into um, you know, internal controls over financial reporting. There are pieces with, you know, if you're doing AR testing that hits accounting system, there are pieces, uh, indirect rates example as well. There are, you know, procure to pay, you know, there are pieces of the purchasing system that hit that. So this isn't just for government contractors or A&E firms who work with government, uh, with the federal government or do put together a ASHTO rate, but there are very good controls and practices that you can put in place that help other aspects of your organization from a financial reporting and internal control perspective. So, you know, kind of to summarize, it really gives you that infrastructure and practice and policies to have more sound business practices and really be able to help springboard you for that rapid growth where you're not investing significantly in the future when you have a bigger group and employees that you're trying to change the culture on, you're doing it earlier and that could really help out. Yeah. Well, Eric, this has been awesome. Thank you so, so much for joining me today and helping to just elaborate on, on all of this. Um, as I mentioned, Cherry Beckard will be doing other podcasts within the professional services industry group. Um, we're hopeful that you'll join us for those as well. Um, all of our podcasts are posted on cbh.com. And as always, if you have any questions or needs, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, but thank you all for listening in. And a special thank you to Eric for joining me today. That was really great. Thanks for having me.